Hello, it's Dr. Ken here with you again. This is electromagnetism lesson number 11, our last lesson in electromagnetism. And we're looking at DC motor control, protection, and a few other variations of DC motor types. So basically, if you're using the contents of the textbook, um, this is sections 14.5 and 14.6. So, first off, DC motor control and protection. Operating large DC motors requires a means of starting it, controlling its speed, and protecting it against a various range of default conditions. Some situations also require the motor to be reversed or to be stopped quickly. And we're going to look at a couple of ways you can do that. But just as a little reminder, let's have a look at a little example about motor start current. Just to get in our heads, it takes a fair bit of current to get a motor started. So here we've got an example of 10 kilowatts at 200 volts. It's a compound motor, which kind of gives us the best of both worlds. It has an armature resistance, which includes the coil impedances, etc., of 0.25 of an ohm. The shunt winding takes 4 amps at 200 volts DC. We're going to calculate the current taken by the motor at the instant it is connected to the supply. So the way we do that is we simply take the resistance at the armature and the resistance at the shunt and we add them together, giving us 0 0.25 ohms. We know that the shunt field is pulling 4 amps at 200 volts. And we'd like to know what the start current is. And we know that the start current is this one here, is the shunt field plus the armature because they're in parallel with each other. So we want to know what the current through here is plus the current through here. We add those two things together and bingo, we will know the total current. So how can we go about doing that? Well, the armature current is reasonably easy to work out. It's simply the voltage divided by the resistance. So our 200 divided by 0.25 is 800 amps. So there's the vast, vast majority of the current. And of course, our shunt field separately, we knew it was 4 amps independently. And we end up adding those together. And the correct answer is 800 amps. So to get a motor up and running, just this um, 10 kilowatt motor, which is not a huge motor, takes 800 amps at start before any back EMF is initialized and reduces our current. So that's going to take a fair bit of thinking about. So how can we go about doing that? So DC motor starters. This is a four position, three terminal motor starter. And basically you have a lever arm connecting the supply to the armature. So you'll notice when we move the arm across to here, we're going to have current through this release catch gadget into the shunt field and back to the supply. We're also going to have current feeding to the armature, but look how many resistors it has to loop through. It's got to loop through all three of these resistors. Now these are reasonably large wattage resistors and we're simply dropping the voltage to the armature so we have less starting current. So the idea is you move up to position one, then you move to position two, then you move to position three, then you move to position four. So slowly you're taking out the amount of current to the armature, or sorry, amount of resistance to the armature, and eventually our arm 
ends up in this position here and we've got no intervening resistance to the armature and the armature gets full current so we get full supply through here through no resistors into the armature and away we go this little magnetic no volt release holds the arm in this position and if this fault should occur it would release the arm and the arm would come back under spring pressure back to the off position so that's a staged lever arm speed controller to bring up the speed of a DC motor or to bring it online and account for its high start currents by putting some resistors in series so here are some pictures of those motor resistors you can see they're quite large um, low resistance values but large wattages because they have to dissipate a fair amount of energy that would have been being absorbed by the armature so on these you can see they're connected in stages and you can see you've got connections here and here here and here on this one you've got a common tab here and you've got a tapping one tapping two tapping three tapping four and there's your four groups of resistors so you can see them here one two three and four they often have to be mounted somewhere where it's well ventilated and the heat that they produce at start can be got rid of quickly and easily speed control now the best way to do speed control is by controlling the current through the field we could control the current through the armature but the current through the armature is normally very very high as you can see from our last example gets up in the order of 400 amps where the field only about 4 amps so we tend to put the speed control in the um, in the shield and you can see here this is a wound bar rheostat and we've got one end of the resistor here the other here and the common is up here so as we slide this backwards and forwards we can vary the amount of windings that are in the resistor and therefore control the value of resistance so that's a 100 watt wire wound slide rheostat you can also get a 100 watt rotary wound rheostat so again we've just got the wires wrapped around here around the side of it I'm kind of doing big loops but there's hundreds and hundreds of these and again there's a terminal at one end of the resistor a terminal at the other end of the resistor and here's the common and the common is connected to this rotating arm and as the arm moves around the track it's effectively switching in different amounts of the resistor and again you can slide that backwards and forwards in any direction you want and that becomes this field device hence we're controlling the voltage drop across the uh, field and therefore the current through the field to adjust how much magnetic flux there is across our armature because that's what the field does so the next thing is we've got our motor up and started either by doing um, start current control or maybe even using speed control but what about slowing our motor down so we can use mechanical braking put a physical brake big drum normally with some brake shoes on it and use a physical brake we can use dynamic braking that's where the motor becomes a generator and supplies current to a load or returns power back to the source and we give that a special name called regenerative braking so dynamic braking has two components you either turn your machine back into a generator 
and you might generate back into some load resistors or you might generate back into the supply and that's called regenerative braking. Plugging, which is where the motor is simply connected to run in reverse. So the motor is running in one direction and you just switch it into reverse and it puts the brakes on big time but you've got to have a supply capable of providing very very large currents because it uh, takes a huge amount of current to bring the motor to a start if you're going to use plugging or reversing the motor. So how do we go about reversing a motor? To reverse a permanent magnet motor the only option is to reverse the polarity of the supply and the reason that works is because the permanent magnet doesn't re reverse you're only reversing the armature so on a permanent magnet motor reversing the supply is reversing the armature in relation to the fixed magnetic field therefore it works beautifully the next reversing a DC motor you've either got to reverse the armature connections or the field connections if you reverse both then both change in the same direction and your motor won't reverse so reversing a permanent magnet motor this is typically how we do it with a two pole changeover set of contacts so here's our supply plus and minus we have two sets of contacts that are mechanically operated together a reversing switch and we have a changeover contacts so this common here is connected to a normally closed on this side and a normally open on this side that combination we call changeover contacts because the contact is the common can change over between normally open and normally closed so we've got two sets of changeover contacts that are connected mechanically together through here. And if we have the changeover in this direction, watch my cursor, and here's the current going to the motor in this direction. So there's the plus being applied to the armature. If I now chase number two, which is the minus, and I'll chase it backwards so it's a bit more obvious. I'll chase it this way. Through two comes back this way and back to the supply. And as the arrows indicate, the current is always traveling in that direction. Therefore, our motor direction is rotating this way. Now let's do it again over here on B where we've changed over the contacts. So you can see our mechanical contacts have changed over. Now let's ch chase the positive through. There's the positive supply. Chase him through. And now he's going to the opposite side of the motor. Opposite side through the armature. Now we'll chase this one through. and it's going to the negative so we've just effectively reversed the direction of the current through the armature so our current now is in this direction therefore our rotation is now in the opposite direction and that only works if your field is permanent so as long as you have a permanent field with a north and a south across your armature in both situations, north and south with a fixed magnet field. So reversing a shunt DC motor little more tricky because quite often the shunt and the armature are either being are being fed together at the same time so normally we would have our shunt and our field connected in parallel 
with our supply looking like this. And we either have to reverse the shield or we have to reverse the armature, but not both. So a shunt DC motor is reversed by changing the polarity of the voltage to either the armature of the field, and this can be done at the motor's terminal box. So you can see here in A, I've got A1 and F1 connected together, like this, and I've got A2 and F2 connected together, and I've got a plus supply. On B, for the opposite rotation, I connect A1 and F2. So I take A1 and I connect it to F2. Then I take A2 and connect it to F1. Like that. And then the A1 is the plus. And the A2 is the minus. And you can see the armature hasn't changed direction, but the field has. And then finally, I can do the whole thing again, opposite rotation. I can connect A1 to F2. And I can connect A2 to F1. And in that case, I've reversed the armature and kept the field the same direction. So either way will work. You've either got to reverse the armature or the field, but not both. Doing it in a series motor, again, very similar arrangement. So initial is this one. So we've got A1 connected to L1. So it's the line connected to A1, so our plus is up here. Our minus is connected to S1. Here's our minus. And our A2 connected there. There it is in series. We go to the second one, the B option. A, again, is connected to L1 on the plus. A2 is connected to S2, that's to the minus, and we connect the other two together. Armature has stayed in the same direction, but we've now reversed the field. And then our third one. Looks a bit complicated, but it's not that bad. In this particular case, A2 has become the plus. A1 is connected to S2. And the supply is connected to S1. Sorry, the negative is connected to S1. And again, the field is say in the same direction, but we've now reversed the direction of the current to the armature. So reversing a compound motor, again, the same applies. You've got to reverse either all the field or all the armature. So when reversing direction of a compound motor, Either reverse the armature connections or both the series and shunt coil connections. So you can see here, here's the original arrangement, A. Then in B, everything has stayed the same. This is the same. But we've simply reversed the armature connections end to end.
in C, the armature has stayed the same in this direction, but we have reversed that field connection and we have reversed this field connection. You must reverse both parts of the field in a compound motor. Armature reaction. We've spoken about armature reaction before, particularly when we're talking about generators, but you also get armature reaction in motors. So in a motor, armature reaction causes the magnetic field to twist in the opposite direction to rotation. So again, if we had our magnetic field and that was the neutral position through there, what happens is as the motor rotates, in this particular case we're rotating in a clockwise direction over here on B, we're creating our own little magnetic fields around the armature conductors which are creating magnetic fields which oppose the main field and we're getting this distortion and you can see it here it's distorting the field in this figure eight shape so we're getting this distorted field so instead of the field sitting here in the middle it actually gets shifted off at this funny angle and it just creates a bit of sparking at the commutator and the brushes. So if this is occurring, instead of having your brushes mounted here on your armature, you literally just move them a few degrees around and move your armature to align with, sorry, your brushes to align on the commutator with the amount of armature reaction. So armature action just causes a bit of sparking which wears your brushes down on your DC motor a little more quickly. And uh, to help compensate for that, we simply move the brushes around. On most larger DC motors, they actually have sliding brush casings for this very purpose. That You can just shift the uh, brushes 10, 15, 20 degrees around to allow for a little bit of armature reaction, depending on how hard your motor is working. Interpoles, interpoles again are a great way of helping to reduce that interreaction. And uh, on this drawing, you can see the main poles. Here's a uh, main pole north. So we've got uh, a four pole machine here with two norths and two souths. And we've got interpoles. So the red ones are the interpoles. So here's my interpoles north and my interpoles south. And they help make the magnetic field um, more concentric, I suppose, is the word we would use. So you can see here on the right-hand side how they're connected. And you can see here the field connecting around in this particular case the field is in series all the field windings are in series and the armature here comes the armature and the armature is connected to the interpoles so here's my interpoles my interpoles are all connected in series i'm just drawing around the interpoles and there they go and then they loop down onto the brushes and then the brushes loop back there's the brushes now looping back and back out to the outside world so the interpoles are all connected in series and they go in the armature circuit they don't go in the field circuit they go in the armature circuit so their magnetic field strength varies with how much current is in the armature helping us to reduce the armature reaction. So two ways we can reduce armature reaction. We can put in interpoles and we can move the brushes a few degrees left or right to help 
putting in interpulse not only reduces armature reaction, it also gives you a much smoother mechanical output from your DC motor. So that brings us to the end of control and operation of basic DC machines. We're now into section 14.6, other types of DC motors. So DC motors described so far have kind of been based on the traditional technologies that has been widely used in industry for 200 years now. Small DC motors that rely on advanced technology are also becoming very widely used. Some of these motors operate on different principles than the traditional motors. We'll go through some of those principles in a moment. So here's a printed circuit board motor. So the actual windings are part of a printed circuit board. It's a very flat motor. So the armature is constructed by etching a complex winding pattern onto a printed circuit board. And you can see it here. So there is still a, a traditional commutator, but again, the commutator itself is also printed onto the circuit board. The windings are printed on the circuit board, the armature coils, and here's your brushes, two little brushes, and they, when you put the lid on, sit on top here so the brushes will sit on top of this section and then you have a eight pole circular magnet so there's a big donut shaped magnet in the top so as you pass current from your brushes I'll draw the brushes just roughly in position. The current runs through this pattern. I'll just, just draw it in very roughly. It runs through here. It runs out the brush. Back, comes back out the other brush here. And of course, that produces a magnetic field, doesn't it? around those printed circuit board wires and that interfer interacts I should say with the magnetic field being produced by this big donut magnet. So we have a big donut magnet nice and flat so if you have a, a, a motor that you're in required to uh, operate in a very low profile shape so here it is very flat like a pancake it's a quite a clever way to produce it's a standard DC motor has all the characteristics of a fixed magnet DC motor but it looks flat like a pancake there's what we call the brushless DC motor quite often used in computer fans and those kinds of things so this type of motor You'll see often in your computers. And the one at the center here is a four pole. And effectively, you've got four little coils. And you've got some fixed magnets connected to the fan on the outside. So there's your four pole circular magnet. Again, donut shaped magnet on the fan itself. And there's a little bit of electronics. So you can see on a printed circuit board around the outside here. There it is there. I'll just very roughly draw around it for you. There's the printed circuit board. There's a little bit of electronics on there. And they're simply switching those coils on in sequence. So they switch on number one. Millisecond later, they switch on number two. They switch off number one, then they switch on number three, and they switch off number two, they switch on number four, and they switch off number three, then they switch on number one, and off number four. And of course, the, the donut-shaped magnet simply chases this 
what we would call a rotating magnetic field around and around and around as the electronics switches each of those little coils on and off. Over on the right hand side we have the same thing just on steroids. So here we have an 8 pole, so 8 pole brushless. So here's 1 pole, 2 poles, 3 poles, 4 poles and there's a coil on each end giving us a total of 8 poles. Again all the electronics is mounted here on the outside quite simple electronics in fact and again there'll be a motor or something similar with a donut shaped magnet that's sitting on the outside connected to a fan or whatever it needs to drive and there'll be simply a ring magnet on the outside again easy to manufacture low profile and often used in computer cooling systems to move air. The stepper motor, very similar to the one we've just seen. So here's a stepper motor. Again, a stepper motor most often has a ring magnet or a donut shaped magnet as its central core and the shaft that's going to provide the physical movement. And then inside we have lots and lots of coils. So we have these coils in here. It's one big coil, but it's tapped at 12 positions. And by turning on particular parts of the coil, so they might turn on this part of the coil in one direction with the current in one direction and this part of the coil in another. So they might make that a north and that a south. Therefore, the ring magnet inside will move from its present position to the new position. The thing with a stepper motor is it's very, very accurate. In this particular case, we've got a 12 pole rotor, so I can divide up that rotational space by 12. And it will give me exactly, exactly 12 positions that I can move it. These are used often in dot matrix printers in precision equipment that needs to move an X number of degrees for an input, stepper motors are very good. We used to use them a lot in dot matrix type printers, line printers, all of those kinds of things. So in this particular case, because it's a 12 pole, the motor can step 7.5 degrees for each operation of the coil, and it's exactly 7.5 degrees. That's the big advantage of a stepper motor, is its precision. So very, very high levels of repeatability that allows us to move a stepper motor around. Again, in this particular case, the electronics are separate to the motor, by the way. We should point that out, that the, um, sorry, I'll just get back to that. The stepper motor, the electronics that operates the stepper motor out here is is remote to the motor it's not built into the motor so this is how the stepper motor actually works as i was just drawing on the other side there step one we set up a north and a south step two we just simply move the north and the south around in this in this particular case 90 degrees which means our stepper motor would have a 90 degrees rather than Sorry, I'll just do that again. We would have a 90 degrees rather than seven and a half like the previous one. In the next switch, switch four, we've simply moved it round 
another 90 degrees and then so on and so forth so effectively all we're doing is got the current through the windings as you can see here and by putting the appropriate amount of current through the appropriate winding I can simply step the motor around 90 degrees at a time um, this is a high resolution stepper motor so instead of having a ring magnet I've got lots and lots of little separate magnets in the face of the rotor so you can see here I've got separate little magnets in the rotor and they look like teeth so the rotor has two sets of toothed magnets and you can see here we've got eight poles but on each pole you can see we've got one two three four five positions and by switching my norths and souths I can move to any one of four positions with these two because I've got these other magnets or the other poles in the face up here remember I've got five of those in the face of the magnet there's three there's four and there's five so that by by doing an arrangement with the switching I've got one two three four different positions for every two segments on here so this stepper motor with separate magnet to rotate that aligns with the segregations of each pole piece each stepper motor moves the rotator by one serration or every 1.8 degrees for this particular motor servo motors come in everything from toys to very sophisticated positioning systems for robotic machines and you're probably used to seeing um, these kinds of things in a typical uh, model aeroplanes or model cars used for speed control and setting and again they just have some electronic control they have a feedback potentiometer here connected via a gearbox to the motor so here's our gearbox the motor drives the gears around one of those gears is also connected to the feedback potentiometer so these normally have either a 90 degree rotation 180 degrees or you can also buy them at 270 degrees and depending on the frequency you put into them you can rotate them anywhere between 0 and 90 if you've got a 90 degree one 0 to 180 if you've got a 180 or 0 to 270 and then you can buy them in different sizes so they typically um, you can get them I think at about five Newton meters of force up to the quite large ones you can get up to about 30 40 Newton meters if you've got to drive the servos for large aeroplanes or remote control cars down the bottom of the picture if you're looking for high precision high power you can buy servo motors for DC equipment they don't actually work that much differently to the toy motors they have inside a very sophisticated um, gearbox and motor assembly that's in here you get your gearbox and your motor 
assembly in this part. Then on the back, you've got your encoder and your feedback arrangements. And again, the finer your encoder, the more expensive they become. And the encoder simply is able to measure where that rotation is, plus and minus so many percent of a degree. So of degrees. And depending on how much you want to pay for how accurate it is and how much power, how much force comes out through the shaft, the price just goes up accordingly. Normally these are controlled with industrial signals. So the signals that uh, come into here, quite often they're supplied with um, 240 volts or thereabouts, 240, 230 volts AC. That's converted to DC to operate the machine. And then the encoder or the positioning of the information, we normally do that with a four to 20 milliamp milliamp signal. So normally there's some kind of power, general power supply, and then you've got a signal that positions the encoder, which is normally coming from an industrial computer. So let's summarize what we've done. So the speed of a DC motor is directly proportional to its terminal voltage and inversely proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. The output power of a DC motor is approximately equal to the product of the back EMF and the armature current. The output power also equals the product of the torque and the speed divided by 9.55. So that's a quick shortcut if you need to get to the output power. Permanent magnet and separately excited DC motors have a nice linear torque and they have really good load speed regulation. In other words, it doesn't matter what the load does, the speed holds very close to the set speed. A shunt DC motor has good load speed regulation. A series DC motor has good starting torque and a compound motor, which is a combo of both, has a combination of both characteristics. A DC motor has resistive I squared R losses, it has core losses due to the changing magnetic field, and it has some mechanical losses caused by friction and windage, that's the fan keeping the motor cool. Efficiency is when the constant losses equal the resistive losses, so that's when we achieve our highest efficiency. A DC motor takes a high starting torque, which is large motors is limited by the motor's starter. And we try to limit that to about 150% of its full load current. If you remember the little example we did, um, pulled well over 800 amps just for a 10 kilowatt motor. A motor starter can be a manual or it can be automatic and consists of resistors connected in series with the motor armature. It has as the motor gains speeds, the starter progressively reduces the amount of resistance required. The speed of the motor is usually controlled by varying the current through the shunt field because it's got far less current that you have to worry about, so it's much easier to control the field than it is the armature. Therefore, we use the armature to control speed. Methods to bring large DC motors to a halt include mechanical brakes, normally a big drum brake with braking shoes on it. Passing the motor's generated current through a load, it's called dynamic brake, and injecting the generated current back into the supply, and we call that regenerative. And we can also reverse the DC supply to the motor, and we call that plugging. A DC motor can be reversed by changing the direction of the current either through the field coils or the armature, but we don't do both. 
otherwise the, there's no relative change then there's no change in direction armature action causes the main magnetic field to distort and to shift the magnetic neutral causing sparking at the brushes it reduces um, frequency efficiency I should say and it also reduces the smoothness of operation of the mechanics of the motor the effects of armature reaction are reduced by adding interpoles to the main poles or using compensating windings which are embedded in the main field poles. In both cases the coils are put in series with the armature that way the field will vary with the armature's load. Other types of motors include printed circuit board motors, brushless motors, stepper motors and servo motors are the other big categories. The armature in a printed circuit motor or a pancake motor is made by chemically etching a fiberglass disc laminated on both sides with copper to create the armature. A brushless motor has an electronic circuit that switches the power to the coils in the starter that creates a rotating magnetic field which the magnetized rotor just simply follows. A stepper motor rotates by a certain angle each time and again has electronic controls as it receives what we call pulses. This type of motor is used in accurate positioning applications. A servo motor is a type of motor, magnet motor, designed to rapidly accelerate and decelerate and do that very very accurately normally having encoders and things built into them so you can tell exactly where the shaft position is at any time a DC tachometer is a permanent magnet motor acting as a generator in other words a feedback device for position and speed where the output voltage is proportional to the shaft's speed and it also can act as an encoder telling us the shaft position. So that brings us to the end of electromagnetism lesson 11 and the end of electromagnetism altogether. So I hope you've enjoyed the video lessons from Dr. Ken and that brings us to the end of electromagnetism.